Hello and welcome. <laughs> On this beautiful evening in Chicago. <laughs> I'm Candace Vogler. I am one of the co-principal investigators on the John Templeton Foundation grant called Virtue, Happiness, and the Meaning of Life. We are currently in the midst of a working group meeting, so we have our scholars here in Chicago. We're reading and discussing each other's work in progress, and as part of every working group meeting, we get to have a lecture, a public lecture. And I am delighted tonight to be introducing Jean Porter as our lecturer for this working group meeting. Jean Porter is the John A. O'Brien Professor of Theology at Notre Dame University. She is a noted scholar of Aquinas' work, um, a noted, I don't know, a reviver of interest in virtue ethics in recent years. Um, I think one of my favorite commentators on Aquinas, her most recent book is on justice as a virtue, it's fantastic. Um, her earlier books are also wonderful, many articles. Um, and she is going to speak to us tonight on what should we fear, courage and cowardice in contemporary public life, mostly American public life. Um, a talk that's co-sponsored by the Martin Marty Center, the Divinity School, the Department of Philosophy, and the Lumen Christi Institute. Please join me in welcoming Jean Porter. I have been exhorted to speak into the mic, and so if I move away from the mic, somebody wave at me, and I will go back to the mic. Uh, Candace, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction and, and for the invitation. Uh, and thank all of you for coming here. I appreciate the chance to talk about uh, some of the ways in which a fairly traditional uh, theory of the virtues can cast what I think is some fresh light uh, on some contemporary public issues. And so with that in mind, let me begin my lecture which, as Candace has already told you, is titled, What Shall We Fear? Courage and Cowardice in a Public Life. Courage is hard to define. We admire men and women who seem to be fearless in the face of danger, and yet courage cannot plausibly be identified with the absence of fear. Fear is a natural part of our lives, and it can be appropriate and salutary. What is more, even a courageous individual may well experience fear as she exposes herself to danger for the sake of something of great value. Near the beginning of his extended treatment of fortitude or courage, in the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas identifies courage as a kind of firmness through which the individual holds fast to the rational good in the face of difficulties. Admittedly, this sounds somewhat bloodless, but for Aquinas and the classical and theological tradition he represents, the difficulties in question include the full variety of labor, loss, and suffering to which we are liable, including death itself, and rational goods include all those ideals and commitments that are possible to us only because we are rational beings, uh, and as such, that they serve to bring meaning to our lives including our love of family, friends, and associates, our commitments to a cherished way of life, and our further commitments to moral standards and ideals. Seen from this perspective, the virtue of courage depends upon a wider context of judgments and commitments. The virtue is both possible and necessary because we believe that some ideals and values are worth great sacrifices and we want to live accordingly. Understood in this way, courage is preeminently an individual virtue. Yet we can also describe a community or a nation as courageous in its response to an attack. To take one well-known example, the behavior and attitudes of the English during the Blitz of 1940 and 41 offers an outstanding example of collective public courage. Somewhat to the surprise of British officials, the civilians subjected to intensive German bombing were not only relatively free of trauma, they were able to carry on with their lives and even to be cheerful in the face of repeated attacks. 
Their bravery under fire depended in key part on a collective commitment to maintain their way of life and the values that sustain that way of life, even in the face of assault. They were prepared to lose their life for the sake of ideals and commitments that helped to give their lives meaning, and by standing firm, they played a key role in turning back the proposed Nazi invasion of Great Britain. The collective courage of the English under the Blitz was, of course, dependent on the courage of countless individuals, and yet it cannot be reduced to the sum of so many courageous acts and lives. The government promoted and individuals cooperated in creating a set of practices and expectations that encouraged bravery and perseverance. At this point, England was a brave society, which both drew its courage from individuals and communicated it back to them. In my remarks this evening, I want to examine another example of public courage and public cowardice, which began to develop within the memory of many of us and is still unfolding today. I am referring to public reactions to the threat of terrorism since the attacks of September 11 of 2001. During and immediately after the attacks themselves, the men and women at the scene, together with the police, firefighters, and medical personnel, behaved with exemplary bravery in the face of an unimagined danger. These clear, unambiguous examples of courage do not call for extended an analysis. However, at another level, public reactions to the threat of terrorist attacks present a more complex and ambiguous example. I want to argue that we as a nation responded initially to terrorist assaults and the threat of further attacks with another kind of courage, not physical bravery, but a firm resolve to hold on to our central values, including equality, tolerance, and respect for the rule of law. However, over the past 15 years, our attitudes as a civic society, as expressed by the actions taken in our name, reflect a growing unwillingness to live with risk and correspondingly an openness to do almost anything to our supposed enemies in order to secure our own safety. In other words, we as a nation have moved from courage to a kind of cowardice when it comes to our attitude towards these threats. Before I go on to defend these claims, let me say something about the approach I am taking. The claim that our attitudes towards terrorism has changed significantly since 9-11, moving generally towards a more repressive and closed stance, is not a new claim. It was defended in a powerful book by the lawyer and legal scholar Joseph Margulies, What Changed When Everything Changed. And as you will see, I draw extensively on his analysis. Margulies and others have commented at length on the exact contours of our changing attitudes and the possible explanations for this trajectory. My own attempts to reflect on these phenomena in terms of virtues and vices is not meant to provide an alternative social analysis, although I do think that classical virtue theory does suggest some insights that we might otherwise overlook. Rather, my approach is aimed at interpreting the trajectory of our responses to terrorist threats in a frankly normative way. Appeals to virtues and vices are meant to uncover aspects of our attitudes that are praiseworthy or blameworthy, and more importantly, to uncover the perhaps obscure motivations for our stance towards others and the world we live in. I realize that this is still quite general, but I hope that my point becomes clearer as we proceed. I should also say something about my use of Thomas Aquinas as a source for virtue analysis. Of course, Aquinas is a Catholic theologian, but I do not intend to appeal to him in order to promote a distinctively Catholic point of view. Aquinas is becoming more and more recognized in secular as well as Catholic and religious circles as one of the leading interpreters of a generally Aristotelian theory of the virtues, and in particular, he offers a rich synthesis of both classical and cl Christian sources on virtue, integrated within an Aristotelian account of fear and resolution and their place in human life. As such, I believe he offers an especially valuable perspective on the motivations behind our responses to the primal fear of attack as these play out in public life. But the proof of the value of this approach uh, can only come by hearing how I use it. <laughs> 
And so with that in mind, I turn to the main body of my paper. The men and women of this country have always taken pride in our collective commitment to ideals of equality, tolerance, and respect for religious beliefs and practices. These, these values are integral to what we think of as the American way of life, and they inform our standards for fairness and equity. Of course, we have never fully realized these values, and at some points we have been all too quick to abandon them. Nonetheless, I think it is fair to say that we as a nation keep returning to these as touchstones for national character, to be reaffirmed and progressively realized. For that reason, our collective faithfulness to these ideals offers a touchstone for evaluating our courage as a nation under threat. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, public officials and the press spoke out strongly in defense of the values of equality and respect for religious freedom, in the face of pressures to hold American Muslims to account for the terrorist activities. President Bush set the tone for public discourse by repeatedly reminding the country, in Margulies' words, that Muslims and, Amer and Arab Americans were not the enemy, and mutual respect and religious tolerance were indispensable elements of American identity. We might question why the president felt the need to make a point of the importance of respecting every loyal and peaceful citizen, but it is important to take account of the uncertainty, confusion, and sheer terror that gripped the nation at this time. President Bush, together with a wide range of other public voices, attempted to unify the country around values which were vulnerable at this point, and the nation generally responded in kind. To a remarkable extent, public and social life went on as before, without additional burdens of repression, of repression and constraint. At this point, and to the extent that the ideals of equality and respect for religious pluralism were genuinely affirmed in the face of serious threat, the American people deserve to be called courageous. Aquinas remarks that fortitude is most clearly exemplified by firmness in the face of the threat of death, especially on the part of someone fighting on behalf of the common good. He goes on to say that fighting in this context can be understood expansively to include other kinds of resoluteness in the face of hostile threats. For example, the firmness of a judge who, who pronounces a just sentence in spite of threats from hostile forces. As it happens, the 9-11 attacks were not followed by further attacks, and it may well be that we were never in as much danger in this period as we thought we were at the time. Nonetheless, there was a widespread sense of danger which at this point could not be countered. Given that, the widely held resolve to maintain core values does deserve to be called a kind of courage, a firmness of mind expressed through a sustained commitment to what Aquinas would call goods of reason. In this case, the, ideal, the ideals of equality, tolerance, and respect for religious pluralism. Of course, this consensus was never universal. There were some prominent voices at this point who challenged the benign view of Islam as a religion, and at least by implication called the loyalty of American Muslims into question. If the general consensus of favor of equality and respect at this time was courageous, should we call these dissenting voices cowardly? In this case, I think the sobriquet of cowardness is misleading. It would imply that those who spoke out against equality and tolerance had previously held these values and were removed by fear to renounce them. But at this point, this doesn't seem to be the case. Rather, those who spoke out initially against the general consensus in favor of equality and tolerance were in fact expressing long-held convictions that some religious or racial groups are preeminently virtuous and others are not. They did not change their values out of fear. Rather, the attacks confirmed long-held convictions and the climate of uncertainty gave them wider scope to express these convictions. I do think these responses reflected a vice, but the vice in question would be injustice. A settled disposition, in many cases a very long settled disposition, to regard and treat some classes of people as inferior or wicked. As Margulies argued, it was not surprising that we heard these voices after 9-11, Nonetheless, at least initially, the national consensus resisted these views, so much so that the favorable perception of Islam as a religion reached its historic high point 
in October of 2001. Yet as Margulies goes on to argue, this collective commitment to ideals of equality and openness eroded over the next several years. Contrary to what we might have expected, we as a society have moved from a stance of relative tolerance and openness to a stance that is more repressive and intolerant in many ways. Public perceptions of Islam and of Arabic nations and peoples have become much more negative. At the same time, public officials have adopted a range of practices that once would have been unthinkable or only rarely used, including torture, indefinite detention without trial, and targeted assassinations. These practices have been widely criticized, but they also have significant and in many ways growing support among the public. When then candidate Trump claimed that he would not only bring back torture, but also impose it on the families of suspected terrorists as well as terrorists themselves, he was widely praised and admired for his toughness. Now, to do him justice, he has since backed down from that claim, at least for now, but the fact that a presidential candidate could propose such a thing at all says a great deal about how far we have come from the courageous openness that marked public life immediately after 9-11. Margulies clearly regards this overall trajectory as evidence of a moral decline. I would agree, and I would add that whatever else we might say, these developments are symptoms of a pervasive public cowardice. This may seem harsh, but if we as a nation were courageous in our affirmation of core values immediately after 9-11, what else can we say about our collective abandonment of these ideals now? It is perhaps worth emphasizing that this judgment is not based on the levels of fear in our public life. According to some polls, our fear of terrorism is greater than it has ever been, even though we have now gone about 16 years without suffering another major attack on American soil. But what I would suggest is that this level of fear is a symptom of a wider breakdown of public resolve, not its cause and not even perhaps its most important expression. Margulies gives extensive attention to our changed policies towards torture and extrajudicial forms of detention and killing. I think he is right to focus on these as symptomatic, and I will say something more about them directly. Before doing so, however, I want to comment on a key moment in the development of our, natural, of our national character, which Margulies does not discuss at length. I am referring to the invasion of Iraq, which was sold to the American people through the manipulation of fear and pursued out of a kind of recklessness which Aquinas would identify as a similitude of courage. In retrospect, it may seem wrong-headed to consider the invasion of Iraq from the perspective of our responses to terrorism. Saddam Hussein was, of course, no friend of the United States, but he was not implicated in the attacks, and even during the build-up to the invasion, this was widely acknowledged. More to the point, some foreign policy experts had been making the case for regime change in Iraq for some time, arguing that we have both a strategic interest and a moral stake, in overturning oppressive dictators and replacing them with some kind of democracy. The attacks of 9-11 offered a pretext for going to war, and at least one senior advisor argued for the invasion of Iraq on that very day. In fact, the actual invasion came later, after Bush and his advisors persuaded both the American public and many of our allies that Hussein, with his weapons of mass destruction, posed an immediate threat to our security. The American public, already primed to believe in threats and dangers, accepted these claims with very little questioning. And why not? The press reported on these claims with little critical scrutiny, and those voices that were raised in dissent were largely, although not entirely, disregarded. In contrast to the immediate reactions to the 9-11 attacks themselves, the American public's responses to the threats posed by Hussein cannot be described as courageous. The citizens of this country were, were fearful, and they were disposed to insist on security without pausing to consider too closely what it would take to respond to that demand. Of course, it is also the case that the American people were being misled into believing that the threats they imagined were far more credible than they actually were. At the same time, even at this point, prominent public officials in a good position to evaluate the claims being made, were raising serious doubts. 
most notably Hans Blix, the chief weapons inspector for the United Nations from 2000 to 2003. His team conducted 700 inspections leading up to the invasion of Iraq without finding any evidence of we weapons of mass destruction or any capacities for producing them. All this was known at the time, but Blix's activities and his reservations did not have much impact on public perceptions. The American people were simply afraid at this point, and they saw the world through the lens of fear. At the same time, if public support for the invasion of Iraq was driven by excessive fear, we have good reason to believe that the political leaders responsible for the invasion were not fearful enough. At this point, it is hard to say exactly what Bush and his advisors actually believed about Hussein's supposed threats, and we cannot speculate on the extent to which they shared in the general climate of fear. However, we do know that in any case, the invasion of Iraq was motivated, in key part if not entirely, by the conviction that we both can and should bring about regime change to foster the growth of democracy. What is more, those who defended this view were inclined to believe that the necessary military actions would not be prolonged or difficult. Tim Russert, interviewing Vice President Dick Cheney just before the invasion, asked, do you think the American people are prepared for a long, costly, and bloody battle with significant American casualties? And Cheney replied, well, I don't think it's unlikely to unfold that way, Tim, because I really do believe that we will be greeted as liberators. There's an even more telling example of this attitude in a much quoted article by Ron Suskind entitled Faith, Certainty, and the Presidency of George Bush. Referring to a conversation with an unnamed official in the administration, Suskind reports that the aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about enlightened principles. He cut me off. That's not the way the world really works. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And when you're studying that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities which you can study too. We're history's actors, and you will all be left to study us. These remarks reflect, represent an attitude that could be described in a lot of ways. But for our purposes, it will be most helpful to consider it from the standpoint of courage and its, avoid, and its vices. Certainly, no one would describe these remarks as cowardly, but we might hesitate to describe them as truly courageous either. Aquinas identifies two closely related vices associated with courage which do seem to fit these sentiments, namely fearlessness and audacity. The fearless individual is, so to speak, insensible to fear, and the audacious person is inclined to take needless or unwise risks. These vices are both opposed to the virtue of fortitude because each in its own specific way leads the individual away from the ideal of rational firmness in the face of risk. Someone who is fearless in the vicious sense is unaware of risk, and someone who is daring will take risks without pausing to consider whether they are worth it. In each case, the failure to give due weight to danger and risk keeps the individual from giving due consideration to values and the kinds of costs that we should be prepared to pay to preserve our values. He cannot stand fast in the light of fears because he is not aware that he has any real reason to be afraid, or else he just enjoys taking risks. The result in either case is a kind of recklessness, which looks like courage, but lacks the firmness that comes from a realistic weighing of value and risk. It would be interesting to consider whether and in what ways excessive fearfulness and recklessness can be combined in the character of one individual. But they can certainly come together in one community, as the attitudes leading up to the invasion of Iraq make clear. Individuals who are oppressed by fear are likely to welcome political leaders who give the impression of being fearless, prepared to confront and defeat whatever dangers are on the horizon. By the same token, however, this combination of private fear and public recklessness is bound to be undermined, uh, cannot provide a stable basis for public peace. To the extent that public confidence depends on the recklessness of its leaders, it is bound to be undermined when recklessness fails, as sooner or later it will do.
I want to suggest that this dynamic may help to explain why public, terror why public fear of terrorism seems to be increasing, even as our memories of the last major terrorist attack on U.S. soil become more remote. Our experiences in Iraq and subsequently in Libya make it clear that we cannot control the dangers that we face or shape reality to our moral specifications. At the end of the day, our only real options are cowardice or courage, and without a realistic assessment of the dangers that we face and the limits of our power, courage will be hard to come by. At this point, let's return to Margulies' examples of our changing attitudes towards practices that once were unthinkable, or at least widely condemned, including torture, indefinite detention, and targeted assassination. It is certainly true, as he acknowledges, that our attitudes have never been static or uniform in these matters. Nonetheless, over the past 16 years, public uh, opinion on these practices has fairly consistently moved in a direction of greater acceptance. Margulies clearly regards these developments as morally regrettable, and so do I. I, I would add that whatever else might be said about our changing perceptions of these practices, the widespread support that they receive is itself an indication of public cowardice. We endorse, or in some cases ignore, the abuses carried on in our name because we are afraid, heightened now by the failure of our political leaders to reshape the world as they promised to do. These attitudes do not reflect a firmness of mind, resolve to hold on to core values even in the face of danger. Can we deny that there is now a strong strain of cowardice in our national character? Our changing attitudes towards torture offer an especially clear illustration of the dynamics of character and their influence on public sentiment. More specifically, they illustrate the ways in which our judgments are formed and sometimes misformed by destructive fear. At one point, Aquinas asks whether the passions can move the will, and he replies that they cannot do so directly. However, they can have a profound effect on the will indirectly by shaping the judgments of our reason. Under the influence of passion, some object or course of action may appear good, even though the individual would reject it in a cool hour. I think that it is safe to say we all know what this means. This capacity for redescription accounts for many a failed diet and many a broken New Year's resolution. More seriously, our abilities to redescribe what we are doing can undermine our deepest commitments by saving us from facing just what it is that we are doing or allowing to be done in our name. The redescription of torture offers a sterling example of this. Many of you will be familiar with the main lines of this story. In the months immediately following the attacks of September 2001, Agents from the FBI and the CIA began practicing what they described as enhanced interrogation, including waterboarding, sleep deprivation for as long as 11 days, forced stress positions, and wall standing, that is, suspending prisoners by hooks in the ceiling for several hours at a time. Some of those involved began to worry, with good reason, that these practices are in violation of domestic and international law. In response to their request, the Office of Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice issued two memos, arguing that these forms of enhanced interrogation are, in effect, in accordance with national and international law. One of these, the so-called torture memo, was, sufficiently, was subsequently released to the press. According to this memo, enhanced interrogations are legal unless they inflict excruciating and agonizing pain equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury, such as organ failure, impairment of bodily functions, or even death. In order to see just how drastically this narrows the scope of what counts as torture, compa compare the definition in the United Nations Convention Against Torture, which was ratified by the United States in 1990, and I quote, torture means any act by which severe pain or suffering whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him a third or a third person information or a confession. Initially, the release of the torture memo and further disclosures about the practices behind it generated widespread outrage. Senator John McCain introduced legislation that would confine military interrogations to non-coercive practices, 
and place constraints on the CIA, arguing that what differentiates us as the United States of America from other countries is the fact that we do not torture. However, as Margulies goes on to recount, in 2006, the Bush administration for the first time publicly began to acknowledge and defend enhanced interrogation policies. Uh, in a speech in 2006, Bush began by reminding the American public of the nightmare attack that forced us into an unprecedented war against an enemy unlike any we had fought before. He went on to emphasize the importance of intelligence, which he said could best be attained from terrorists themselves. In order to attain this information, inter interrogators needed access to enhanced interrogation techniques, which he asserted are not the same as torture. We as Americans do not torture, he said. He did not add that we feel free to change the definition of torture so that whatever we are doing is not counting as torture. Margulis argues that this change of approach played a critical role in changing public perceptions. The result has been sobering. In late 2001 and early 2002, when the perceived threat was at its peak and the demand for immediate intelligence was palpable, only a small fraction of the population supported the idea of torture as a governmental policy. A decade later, the proportion had swollen to more than half the population. Within some segments of society, support for torture is overwhelming. Of course, this is not the end of the story. In 2008, Barack Obama was elected by an overwhelming majority, due in part to widespread opposition to some aspects of Bush's anti-terrorism policies. In early 2009, in one of his first official acts, Obama banned torture and closed the U.S. intelligence facilities in which it had taken place. These actions were widely praised, but they also met with widespread criticism. More importantly, Obama himself did not follow through with any kind of investigation into the origins and development of the programs in question, and to some extent he discouraged the Senate from pursuing its own investigations. Much less did he call for the prosecution of those individuals involved in authorizing and carrying out these practices, as he was in fact bound by international law to do. Had he done so, our, re our repudiation of torture as a policy would have been placed on a basis legally and socially that would be very, very hard to undo. As matters stand, it would be relatively easy for President Trump to reinstitute torture as a policy if that is what he finally decides to do. And if he does so, he would likely have wide support. According to a survey by the Pew Research Center published in February of last year, 58% uh, of all Americans support torture in some circumstances. We can mention other examples of practices and attitudes which were once widely condemned and now are widely accepted. Near the beginning of Obama's first term, there was widespread support for closing the prison at Guantanamo, thus effectively ending a practice of, in, of indefinite detention without trial. Yet by 2010, this support had largely vanished, and majorities now consistently oppose closing Guantanamo and favor trying suspects in military rather than civilian courts. The Patriot Act, which authorizes indefinite detention and secret surveillance, among other provisions, has been renewed every four years with bipartisan support and little public outcry. Even more troubling, Muslim communities have been subjected to infiltration and surveillance with almost no public reaction. We can be grateful that Trump's proposed travel bans targeting several predominantly Muslim countries were blocked by the courts, but these were only extreme expressions of attitudes that have not been widely challenged. Finally, it is worth noting that Obama expanded the use of drones and targeted killing by almost tenfold compared to the Bush administration. And here, too, he had the support of the majority of the public, at least as late as early 2015. Again, about 58% were in favor of the use of drones, although almost half of these polled also expressed some concerns about civilian casualties. While we may disagree about some of these details, it seems clear that the American public opinions and sentiments have moved unevenly but steadily in the direction of greater fearfulness and less commitment to the ideals of equality, tolerance, and respect 
that we still cherish as part of our national identity. I have argued that these developments can be interpreted in terms of classical conceptions of courage and cowardice. If the hallmark of courage is firmness in the face of danger, then we must admit that we as a nation have not been consistently courageous and we are paying a price. A failure of courage is morally problematic in itself, and in addition, it gives rise to false perspectives which distort our view of the others and the world we inhabit. Paradoxically, excessive fear is closely linked to various forms of recklessness, which provide at best a brittle security. Fear is intolerant and unkind, and it makes enemies where we most need friends. It leads us away from our values, and it undercuts the resources that we need precisely in order to face dangers effectively. At the same time, I do not want to claim that we as a society are simply cowardly, or much less to suggest that we have resources for, that we have no resources for a better response to the dangers we face. We expect individuals to develop some consistency of character, but a community will never be completely consistent in its attitudes and dispositions. In this context, inconsistency is potentially a good thing. Even in our worst moments, we collectively have resources of courage that we can identify and develop. It is important to remember that we as a nation initially responded to the attacks of 9-11 with great courage, expressed through a collective resolution to live by core values in the face of this dire threat. Aquinas observes that courage is most evident in our responses to sudden events. We have reason to hope that this collective courage represents something more central to our identity than later examples of our collective favor, failure of nerve. At the beginning of my remarks this evening, I observed that while the virtues are strictly speaking qualities of individuals, it can be helpful to identify public virtues and vices, understanding the term in an extended but I hope legitimate sense. I would now add that one advantage to this approach is that it avoids moralizing judgments on individuals or on distinct classes or political factions. We are all responsible for the moral quality of our community, implicated in its failures, and jointly responsible for its good estate. With this in mind, I want to suggest some strategies for reclaiming the courage that is central to our national character at its best, and avoiding the temptations to recklessness and cowardice that are still very much a part of our day-to-day -day experience. The first of these is the most obvious, but in our current political climate, it would be easy to overlook it and perhaps difficult to attain it. The hallmark of courage is a firm and resolute adherence to values in the face of danger. That is, the courageous individual or community is prepared to run risks, even significant risks, rather than sacrificing or betraying centrally important ideals and commitments. This implies that if we as a community are to reclaim courage, we need an extended public conversation about the risks we face, the values that we share, and the levels of risk that we are prepared to endure for the sake of holding on to these values. We as a community have not had many conversations like this recently, and yet they are essential for generating a sense of national solidarity and resolve. Public debates over risk and value require, first of all, an honest examination of the dangers that we actually do face, and that in itself will be a challenge. In many cases, we will find that our fears are exaggerated, but in other respects, we are probably not afraid enough. In any case, once we have attained some measure of sober realism about the dangers we face, we will be in a position to debate which kinds and levels of risks are worth it, given the values that are at stake. Are we prepared to give up some measure of security in order to maintain a relatively open and tolerant society? Are we willing to rule out unjust or cruel practices such as torture, even for the sake of securing greater safety? These are two examples of a range of hard questions that we as a society need to discuss in order to develop the quality of reflective firmness that is central to courage. This brings me to a second strategy. A serious consideration of danger and risk is difficult and yet necessary because dangers frighten us. But these considerations are not only frightening, they are also frankly depressing. Fundamentally, we have less power than we believe or wish we had 
and there are many wrongs in this world that we cannot put right. In order to develop and sustain courage, we need to cultivate other virtues, which enable us to live with the regrets and the sadness and inevitably follow up on a consideration of world affairs. Aquinas mentions two virtues which are especially relevant to our current situation, namely patience and perseverance. Both resemble courage insofar as each has something to do with maintaining firmness of mind in the face of difficulty. At the same time, neither is directly concerned with fear and danger. The virtue of patience enables someone to hold on to ideals and commitments in the face of sadness, and perseverance is expressed through persistence in doing good, even when one's efforts seem pointless and futile. These are the quotidian virtues that come to the fore when we are not in the middle of a crisis, and as such, they are likely to strike us as relatively unimportant. Yet I want to suggest that patience and perseverance have a critical role to play in our public life, as well as in our, in our, in our individual lives. Both virtues dispose us to acknowledge the many forms of injustice, poverty, and long-standing hostility that give rise to terrorism, to accept that some of these ills are beyond our control, and that others can be addressed only through persistent, patient, long-term action. Patience, in particular, is a safeguard against recklessness and the recurrence of fear that so often follows on the collapse of recklessness. Both virtues provide a context for the deliberation and judgment of practical wisdom, collectively as well as individually, by keeping us in the reality-based community that is ultimately our moral and, and practical home. Above all, patience and perseverance, together with courage itself, play an indispensable role in sustaining our commitment to justice. The ideals of justice, in turn, motivate and inspire us to live courageously as a community that cannot be frightened into self-betrayal. We exhibited that courage most immediately in the immediate ab aftermath of the attacks of 9-11, and we have the resources to reclaim that courage today. Thank you. Thank you, I really enjoyed that. Um, I have a question, though, about your brief remark that one of the marks of um, public virtue or maybe civic virtue is um, collective responsibility. Um, like, and I just I wondered if you could say more about what that really amounts to, practically speaking, and also does it come with collective guilt? Well, I think if you pass any kind of collective moral judgment at all, uh, you have to talk about both collective praise and collective blame or guilt. Now, I don't have a strong theory of that. You know, I'm not making judgments here uh, about the extent to which individuals are voluntarily responsible for or morally implicated in, in social sins. So. I, I'm making a low-flying, non-theoretical point, but I still think there's something to it. Um, I mean, we do have a sense of what it means as a community to reflect and to deliberate. Uh, we take stands as a community which come out of our individual commitments and choices but can't be reduced to the sum of these. Uh, I, I take it as a hallmark of a public uh, stance, whether virtuous or vicious, that in some way it reflects both widespread public view, which I know is never universal, and also some significant public action. Uh, and so in all these senses, I do think it makes sense to talk in terms of, of collective responsibility. Uh, but I repeat, I don't have a strong theory here of corporatism or anything of that sort. I'm simply trying to capture what I think is, uh, is a fairly evident and, and on a low-flying level a, a fairly obvious feature of public life, Th that we do deliberate in these ways and take responsibilities in these ways. Kathy, someone hand the lady a mic. Um, Jean, I know that you're a, um, interested in, in legal developments when you um, talk about and read about these things. In all the years since, um, 9-11, I would say that the courts have been consistent um, upholders of uh, 
the values that you talked about in the beginning, and beginning with all the rights they've accorded to prisoners in Guantanamo. And I, I would note that in the travel ban case in Hawaii, the circuit court, the Ninth Circuit Court, raised questions, questions about the precedent of Korematsu, which I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's a big legal difference between Korematsu and the, legal, the Muslim ban, perhaps. But the fact that people are thinking about what history has taught us, I think is interesting. I wonder what you, if you regard those signs as a uh, little bit more hopeful. I, I generally agree with you. I mean, I, I, I should add, for those of you who don't know her, um, uh, Kathy is a student of mine and a former judge, so <laughs> she's certainly in a position to talk about law uh, far more than I am. But I do watch what the courts do, and, and I think generally you're right. Um, and, you know, that, that gets to a point that I think connects with Jennifer's question as well. You know, I talk about broad trends here, and I talk about the general direction of a public consensus, and, and I think that that's legitimate and important. But these matters are never universal, uh, and when things are generally going well, that's a moral danger. But when we're having trouble collecting ourselves morally, there are always going to be some resources. Uh, there's always going to be something that can leverage a wider positive change. Uh, and in this case, I think the courts have generally played a very positive role. Um, and, uh, you know, Neil Gorsuch is saying in press conferences, we have to obtain the rule of law and we're a country of laws and not, uh, you know, men and women. Uh, so, hey, uh, power to him. Uh, okay, now I want to field my own questions, but there's like five people with their hands up. I, I was, I, I'm just going to start with you and go around the room. So hand the gentleman a mic. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about the middle third of that definition of fortitude. Um, in the face of danger, I think Aquinas would grant the contiguity of nearby dangers and far away dangers. Mm -hmm. um, your reference to the Blitzkrieg, I think, is a helpful one in, in understanding contemporary events. But whereas the inhabitants of London and other British cities learned about bombing through the rumbling of the earth, and we today learn about uh, terrorist attacks through cable news or our smartphones, uh, what do the avenues by which we perceive danger, how do they affect our standpoint of rational goods? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And you raise a point that, uh, that sort of highlights one of my own assumptions, and, and I'll just say it. I would be prepared to defend it, um, but you're quite right. I hadn't given it the attention I should have. I, I do think that courage in the proper sense involves firmness of mind, not only in the face of an immediate and imminent threat, but in the contemplation of a likely or even a possible threat. Um, otherwise, um, to take a, a very sort of banal example, um, a soldier would not be courageous except when he's actually under fire. Uh, someone who was preparing to undertake a dangerous mission and did it with resolve couldn't be called courageous until they actually started shooting at him. And I, I don't think anyone really wants to hold that. I, I think your point about the ways in which we become aware of threats is very important because it touches on something that I think is really hard to get right, but, but very important in thinking not only about courage, but all the virtues. The, the moral virtues are bound up with perceptions. And the ways in which we form our perceptions and the ways in which perceptions are fed to us um, both say a lot about why we're responding in the ways that we do, and then in turn, in, in the ways in which we appropriate and develop them, say a lot about our own virtuous character. And I think in this case, the ways in which our dangers are presented to us and described by us and perceived by us are not morally neutral. You know, I, I think it's morally relevant that we perceive dangers as being far greater than they are. I don't think that's just misinformation. I think the perception is a result of fear. And I think by the same token, the ways in which the media picks up on dangers, feeds them to us, emphasizes certain aspects, 
de-emphasizes others. You know, all of this, I think, is not morally neutral. Um, I, parenthetically, I was in England uh, when they published, when the New York Times published all the uh, pictures from the Manchester bombing scene. And, uh, you know, I'm all for free press and all that. And, you know, I'm not going to prosecute them or anything. Um, but I had two reactions. One was that I understood why the British government and the British police were very, 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 very unhappy. But my other thought was, why did they do that? Why did New York Times need to do that? And, and what does that say about the ways in which the press also is implicated in a climate of fear and a culture of fear? A am I over answering your question? I tend to get carried away. Okay. Now, let me see. Everybody raise your hand so I can kind of see. Okay, let me start with Tal, Bob, and then this lady here, and then uh, Michael, and then Eric. I'm good, aren't I? So give Tal a microphone. You got to have a mic, Tal. Oh, now I do. So, um, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm I'm thinking about the figure who's interviewed in the Susskind piece that you mm -hmm. mentioned, and you called him audacious and understood that to be a kind of uh, uh, a tendency to toward recklessness in assessment of risk. But it seems to me that there's a more specific account of the uh, flaw in the outlook that we encounter there. Um, that figure doesn't seem to me to exhibit a, a general audaciousness in the face of risk, but rather a kind of a hubris about capacity to reshape the, the world. Um, so in plotting the details of military actions, uh, exercises, uh, you know, invasions, such a figure might be very risk averse when it comes to, you know, putting American lives at risk, uh, but uh, still be insensitive to the particular risks posed by attempts to reshape the course of history. And for me, that suggests a different kind of vice, uh, I don't know, a, a hubris, uh, uh, rather, you know, um, an overestimation of capacity to predict and control events. And I, I suppose I see something like that same vice showing up in public affirmation of um, you know, extrajudicial killings and detentions and torture, there's a tendency to disregard uh, the fog that presents itself to anybody who wishes to use such violence in the name of bringing about good results. Uh, and when that fog is ignored and, there, and, and one is bitten by the temptation to overestimate one's grip on how things really are and what it would take to reshape them, torture, extrajudicial killings and detentions all look somewhat more palatable even if one might still have a strong reaction of conscience against them. So just another suggestion about what vice might be combining with certain kinds of cowardice to produce our current pathologies? Well, you know, uh, the vices are not exclusive. I mean, generally, I mean, they're not exactly connected the way the virtues are, but they do tend to run in packs. Um, I, I wouldn't deny much of what you say, Tal, but I would just go back to my comments in answering this gentleman's question. How do you come to have a view of the world uh, that let you say confidently, we shape reality and you are going to study the reality that we shape. A lot goes into that. You know, a lot of things have to go wrong for you to begin to think that way. But I would suggest that one plausible construal of what's going on is that a certain insensibility to fear has contributed to a way of thinking about the world. Uh, and assuming that one's power and control are greater uh, than, than they normally would be. I mean, to put it in, in the, the old-fashioned way, the fearlessness in this case, I think, removes an impediment uh, to other kinds of vicious and sinful uh, behavior. And certainly the effect of the invasion was a kind of recklessness. Uh, and my, my larger point is that recklessness and fear...
are always going to go hand in hand. Uh, that if you're reckless, this is the collective you, the, the rhetorical you, if you're reckless, reality is going to get, is going to get you. <laughs> you know, and then the, the likely response to that is going to be a rebound into fear, which, which I think we've seen. Bob, I think you were next. You've spoken very um, inspiringly about courage, but you also spoke about justice and wisdom. And um, I have a kind of a, maybe a somewhat technical question about the individuation of these virtues. Would you say that um, justice is a part of courage? Is wisdom a part or aspect of courage? And um, so one question that could be raised in this um, theme would be whether there can be unjust courage or unwise courage. Whether that, you know, it's possible to separate those other virtues. Well, let me distinguish between the virtues, properly speaking, and the extended sense in which I'm using the term. Um, Aquinas says of the virtues, properly speaking, as character traits of individuals, you can understand them in one of two ways, as general qualities which are present in any moral act, or as qualities which pertain to distinctive faculties and have distinctive fields of operation. And now the latter way of understanding that is Aquinas' preferred way, uh, and, and mine too, for that matter, when we're talking about individuals. When you talk about virtues at the public or the communal level, I think it makes more sense to speak of the virtues in the former way, that these are qualities of character and disposition and action, each of which is present in praiseworthy or, or, or resolute activities, and which break down in different and interesting ways when, uh, when, you're in when you're in a period of moral breakdown. Now, I would say that both at the public and at the individual level, you cannot have unjust or unwise courage, that what you have is a similitude of courage. In order for that to be something other than stipulative, you have to talk a little more about what's at stake in saying the virtues are connected in the ways they are. And without nattering on about that, which I can do, um, I natter with the best of them. I will say that at the public level, the attitudes that are implicated in our particular action are always going to have a long-term effect in the moral and, and just the practical course of what we do. Um, again, I think this is illustrated by the invasion of Iraq. Uh, this looked courageous, it looked bold, it even could look like an act of justice or altruism. You know, we wanted to liberate the people. But it was not, a, it was not wise, it, I think it was not just. Um, and the attitudes and commitments and values that we had were not of a kind that could sustain anything other than a certain kind of recklessness. And I think that's part of why the, the whole stance broke down. So anyway, we can come back to this, but that would be my general point. Um, I don't know your name, ma'am, but I think you're next. Yes. Hi. Hi. My name's Ellen. Uh, I'm just visiting. Uh, but I guess one question was, just a simple one was, who is Margulis, who you referred to a lot? I, um, I wasn't sure. but and. But just the other is, I'm, how, how does this apply to kind of the fascist state? It, it seems to me the state is acting in a, you know, intentionally using fear, mongering to, you know, have forever war. <laughs> so I don't know if you can comment on that. Uh, oh, yeah, I sure can. Um, First of all, Joseph Margulis, um, the author of the book I, re I rely on, What Changed When Everything Changed, he uh, is a lawyer and a legal scholar. Uh, he was very heavily involved in, in the defenses of some of the Guantanamo Bay and, uh, convicts. So he's someone 
who has a very long and extensive experience practically uh, as well as theoretically with these issues. Um, when you say the fascist state, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether you mean specifically fascism as we experienced it in Germany and Italy, um, or if you mean generally uh, a kind of collectivism and control. I, I, I think in the case of, of um, German, and, and especially German and to some extent Italian fascism, fear played a central part in giving some legitimacy uh, to the to the National Socialist regime because it played on people's fear of being squeezed out, um, their fear of not having sufficient space or land to survive, uh, the sense that they were in a competition, that they were in danger of losing. And, you know, these things never come alone. I mean, it, it also played into a whole range of attitudes of resentment, anger, uh, the, the deep anti-Semitism. So fear was not the only factor, but it was a factor. I, I think the general point is, is well taken, and I think it's a very reasonable worry, uh, that when people are afraid, they become very willing to turn to whoever or whatever they think is going to protect them, and they become ready to do what it takes to be protected. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important to think about courage at the public level. Um, parenthetically, at one of the things I looked at, I, I looked at all kinds of things in the public discourse, uh, and one of them was an article by a woman named Molly Ball in September of 2016, and she said, if Trump is elected, it will be because of our fear. Uh, and I read that and I thought, that was a prophetic article. Um, you know, I think that that explains a lot. It doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. Michael? Hi, thanks, Dean. That was really interesting. You mentioned towards the end ways in which we could try to better the situation going forward, such as having um, franker and better informed um, discussions about what the risks actually are and so forth. And so I was thinking in the same spirit about more remote kinds of preparation. Um, and to some extent, they have to do with virtues. And I know that'll please you. So anyway, I'm just going to throw, throw the two things out and then um, invite you to comment if you want. The first has to do with what I, at any rate, take to be a kind of very widespread intellectual failing, even a philosophical failing, which is simply that a lot of people think, I think this is extremely widespread, at the end of the day, the end really does justify the means. And it's unfortunate to bomb orphanages, but sometimes you just have to do that. And at least from my perspective philosophically, there actually are some things that are always wrong to do. And if people were more willing to countenance that, then they would be more willing to say things like, we'll never torture people, rather than just, well, we probably will try really hard not to. So that's, so, but, if, if the, and, and philosophers, of course, share a lot of blame for encouraging this um, and justifies the means mentality. Anyway, I'm just thinking like um, a sort of intellectual deepening and improvement would be part of a longer term strategy. The other thing is it strikes me that to a very significant extent we have a sort of hedonistic and self-indulgent culture um, physical and psychological comfort are extremely important to us. And when people are, are like that, it's not surprising when they aren't courageous. And I sometimes think if we were a little bit tougher, <laughs> then we could, all, we could be a little braver. You're making a couple of very interesting and very good points. And, you know, sharp philosopher that you are, you're picking up on the fact that I have a lot of presuppositions behind this talk. One of which is that indeed there are some kinds of things that ought never be done. Uh, I think we have to tread very carefully here because I don't, I certainly don't want to say that you have to hold that view in order to be a virtuous person. I, I mean, that would be kind of like an example of hubris, and even I cannot rise to that level of hubris. Uh, you know, uh, 
there, there is a lot of room for good faith disagreement at the theoretical as well as at the practical level. Um, I think at the same time, I, well, there are two things I would say. One is I do think that we do have a stake in defending some version of the claim that I think you and I share. And it does have a practical point. And acknowledging that practical point doesn't mean condemning or ruling out of sort of moral conversation people who have seriously, who seriously entertain different theoretical views. But it does help to remind us that what we're doing is not just theory. I, I don't think it ever is just theory. Um, the other point about being tougher, um, wouldn't hurt. Uh, you know, again, this has to do with the ways in which we construe our situation, uh, the kinds of deprivations or, or penalties or sorrows that we're willing to, to endure. Uh, I have thought for a long time, and this is not a popular view, that we made a big mistake eliminating the draft. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the, I, I think it's fairer to put a burden of national defense on everybody impartially. And, and, I would, and yes, I would draft women as well as men. Um, but I think it's also the case that universal conscription would give everyone a stake in dealing with these issues that we otherwise don't have, and it would toughen us up. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, and I think there are some practical ways we might consider addressing some of these issues. I'm sorry. Yes, Eric, I'm sorry. Uh, there you are. Thank you, Jean. I was wondering if you could uh, help us shed some light on the metacognitive aspect. And so it strikes me as a relatively robust fact that the people, by and large the men, who think of themselves as most courageous, decisive, realist, and so on, are also the first to flinch in the face of relatively minor dangers and therefore the least courageous. What sort of failure is this by your lights? Well, um... If that is in fact the case, um, and, and I'll take your word for it that it is, I, I would say that there are two problems there. One is cowardice and the other is a lack of self-knowledge. I mean, in, in a way this gets to Michael's problem. We, I, I think for any of us, for communities and for individuals, um, well again, it really goes back to Tao's question, you know, the vices tend to run in packs. Um, we aren't aware of ourselves as courageous or, coward or cowardly because we haven't really faced dangers directly and head on. Um, the dangers that we face are remote or theoretical and we may not recognize our responses for what they are because we don't have a touchstone of judging how we respond to, to an immediate or sudden threat. So I think it's very easy to deceive ourselves in this way and kind of important to try not to do it. But I do think we can move beyond self-deception. Um, on that, I will hold pretty firm. Shall we stop? Okay, good night. <laughs>